Hey everybody, in this video I'm going to look at the law of cosines. So the plan is pretty straightforward. I'm going to state and prove the law of cosines. I'll examine two problems that use the law of cosines. And along the way, I'm going to use desmos.com slash scientific, a really nice utility that's available online. So here's a statement of the law of cosines. You have a triangle with sides A, B, and C. And let's label the angle between the sides labeled A and B. We're going to call that theta. And the law of cosines asserts that C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cosine theta. So before uh, we get going, let's notice something about this formula. There's sort of an axis of action, sort of a privileged position that both the sides C and the angle theta have. And then sort of flanking this axis is the, uh, or the, is the pair of sides A and B. And you'll notice in the formula that um, C and theta do in fact sort of have a privileged position within this formula. And A and B play identical roles. In other words, if you literally swapped A and B, you'd have the very same formula. So this can help you sort of keep the law straight when you're looking at a triangle and trying to re remember what the law of cosines looks like. Just remember this sort of axis picture um, with the flanking sides that behave the same way. All right, so how are we gonna prove this thing? So what we're gonna do is take our triangle, wherever it lies in the plane, we're gonna use a rigid motion and put it onto the axis so that the vertex with the angle theta is going to be at the origin and then the side uh, labeled B is going to run along the positive X axis. So when you do that, obviously this vertex now has coordinates zero, zero and more interesting and useful is the fact that th this vertex here has coordinates B zero. To find the coordinates of the third vertex, we're going to drop an altitude. We're going to use a little right triangle so uh, trigonometry. So here's this side is a cosine theta, this side is a sine theta, and therefore the coordinates of this third vertex are a cosine theta, comma, a sine theta. Now, um, we should note that this proof still works when theta is greater than or equal to pi over 2. I've drawn this picture. I, I, I don't want my proof to somehow depend on the fact that theta is acute. So I'll just point out that if theta had been obtuse, um, the right triangle trick still works and the coordinates are still a cosine theta, a sine theta, and the proof will proceed exactly the same way in this case. But anyway, back to the case that we have pictured here. What, what we'll do now is we will recall the distance formula and remember how that works. So if you have points x1, y1 and x2, y2 and you want to calculate the distance between those two points, you can imagine a little right triangle. Now this side is going to be the absolute value of x1 minus x2. What are the absolute value bars there for? Well, we don't, despite the picture, we don't really know whether x1 or x2 um, are further to, is further to the left. So uh, the absolute value bars will make it safe and independent of the picture. And similarly, this side is absolute value of y1 minus y2. Now we just take the sum of the squares and we should get the distance squared. And this of course is really just the Pythagorean theorem. So the distance formula is really a thinly disguised version of the Pythagorean theorem. Now in our case, these are the coordinates of the two vertices and we know the distance is C. So we can just plug all this into the distance formula and we get this equation right here. And this is the equation that ties together A, B, C and theta. So we just need to do a little algebra to clean this up. If we carefully square this, we get a squared cosine squared theta minus 2ab cosine theta plus b squared. And this term squared is just a squared sine squared theta. Now we will take these two terms and factor out the a squared and collect them together. And then we recall that cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is 1. So this simplifies quite nicely. And there you have it, the law of cosines. Now, of course, we can return this triangle to wherever it came from using a rigid motion. So um, the law of cosines does not require that your triangle be in that special position. It's going to work for any triangle sitting in the plane. Let's look at a very special case. When theta is pi over 2, you get a right triangle. But of course, if theta is pi over 2, then cosine of theta is 0. And in that case, the law of cosines becomes c squared equals a squared plus b squared. And of course, what we've done is we've recovered the Pythagorean theorem. 
So what's going on? Here's the law of cosines. What we can do is we can think of it as a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. It applies to any triangle, not just right triangles. It has this little adjustment term at the end, negative 2ab cosine theta. But please notice that we didn't somehow prove the law of cosines, which then gives us the Pythagorean theorem as a corollary. In fact, it's more like we needed the Pythagorean theorem as a lemma to prove the law of cosines. And indeed, Another way to think about this is proving the Pythagorean theorem amounts to proving a special case of the law of cosines, and then the general law follows immediately from that special case. All right, so let's take a look at the law of cosines in action. So the constellation of Orion is one of the most noticeable constellations in either hemisphere, and the two brightest stars are called Rigel and Betelgeuse. And it is estimated that Rigel is 772 light years from Earth, while Betelgeuse is 643 light years from Earth. And the stars are separated in the sky by 18.56 degrees. So of the 360 degrees, uh, as you work your way around the sky, um, 18.56 degrees separates Rigel from Betelgeuse. So the question is, to the nearest light year, what is the distance between Rigel and Betelgeuse? So what we want to do is we want to get uh, a plane in which we see the Earth, Rigel, and Betelgeuse all together in one plane. And so here we can see the distances and the angular separation all in one shot. And we want to know what this distance d is. So let's give names to these distances and the angle in between, uh, r, theta, and b. And the reason we want to do that is we can write out the law of cosines um, in a more um, reasonable way. We don't need the numbers cluttering the scene here. And then, of course, d is going to be the square root of this quantity. And now we just need to work out what this is. So to do this, I'm going to go over to desmos.com slash scientific, which is this wonderful online utility for doing calculations. Uh, it's like the left-hand column of the normal graphing Desmos utility. There's no graphing part. You might think, well, why would you want to skip the graphs? Well, sometimes you just need the cells to calculate some things. And this is a very powerful, um, handy tool. And, and I use it quite a lot. So the first thing is make sure you're in degree mode. It starts up by default in degree mode. And you'd want to change that if you wanted to use radians. And now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to give names to my distances and the angle in between. So I'm going to actually set the registers r, b, and theta equal to the relevant data here. And then once I do that, I can actually plug in the expression to calculate d. And for good measure, give that the name d in case I want to do further calculations with that. So here I am plugging in the expression. And in the end, I get about 261 light years. Now, I really, really like this approach because now if I want to check my work, I can look at this and I can make sure my data is correct and my expression is more meaningful. I can see the ghost of the law of cosines in that expression much easier than if I had used 772, 643, and 18.56 in that formula. So this helps me modularize my thinking. And, and so I use registers quite a bit to label specific data so that the general um, concept is clear in the expressions I use. So now let's think about uh, the triangle rules SSS, SAS, and all that. So a quick reminder of these congruence rules. If you were to specify three sides of a triangle and those sides are compatible with a triangle, then the congruence class is set. Specifying three sides determines the congruence class of a triangle. So SSS means that uh, if two triangles have corresponding sides that are all equal in pairs, then you know that they're actually congruent. There's another law which says that if you specify two sides and then the angle between them, then in fact, you will have specified the whole triangle because there's really only one way to fill in that missing side to get a triangle. So in this case, what we have is the side angle side rule. 
Put another way, specifying two sides and the included angle determines the congruence class of a triangle. So you could ask, is side side angle rule a thing? If you were to specify a side, a neighboring side, and then the next angle that you needed um, to have a triangle, you could look at this and say, well, I can make a triangle. But you see in this example that there's actually another triangle you can make with that same data. So there are actually two non-congruent triangles that satisfies the original data. So there is no side-side angle rule. However, the law of cosines allows you to find both missing sides at once in the ambiguous case. So let's take a look at this. This is going to be a side-side angle problem, the ambiguous case. We'll have side 7, side 12, and then we'll say that this angle here needs to be 22.5 degrees. Now, we have pictured one solution, and of course this is another one, and what we'd like to do is determine the missing side x. Well, there are going to be two of these, and, and we're going to use the law of cosines to find both of them at one time. So if we apply the law of cosines, we get 7 squared is equal to x squared plus 12 squared minus 2x 12 cosine 22.5 degrees. Now we can just rearrange this with a little bit of algebra here and you might notice that I did not uh, actually expand 12 squared, 7 squared, it's not that hard of a calculation, but I'm actually going to leave it like this and I might call this strategic laziness because it leaves in place the data from the problem. And I'm about to put this into Desmo Scientific anyway, so I'm just going to leave it like this. And now I'm going to notice that if I set a equal to 1, b equal to negative 24 cosine 22.5 degrees, and c equal to 12 squared minus 7 squared, I can rewrite this as the quadratic equation, 0 equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And then the good old quadratic formula comes to the rescue, and this will give us the two values of x. So over in Desmo Scientific, I will put in the coefficients a, b, and c as they appear in this problem. And now I can just type out the quadratic formula. Now, shrewd use of copy and paste, I don't have to retype the other root. I can just paste, change that sign, and there you have it. I now have the two values of x that correspond to these two possible solutions to the initial data, 16.369 and 5.803. And there we have the two missing sides for the two different triangles that solve the initial side-side angle data.